the assessment of neonatal hypoglycemia has to be very careful in to decide as to which newborns actually require assessment because the amount of workup and the amount of treatment is quite vast and extensive if one starts to decide on workup and not to miss on newborns who actually have persistent forms which require evaluation. So it's a close balancing act between doing right workup at the right time in appropriate situations. So newborns who have persistent hypoglycemia beyond 48 hours, which is considered the time by that time the child should have a normal response like an adult. Those who require a high glucose infusion rate beyond 12 mg per kg per minute or those who have no risk factors like a prematurity, small for gestational age or other situations should be evaluated comprehensively for the cause and further causes and workup of hypoglycemia. History should look at birth weight, which if it is low should point to the possibility of a small for gestational age child with prolonged hyperinsulinism. Macrosomia will inf indicate an infant or diabetic mother, pick with Wiedemann syndrome or a potassium ATP, channelopathies. Normal birth weight with persistent hyperglycemia, particularly with hyperinsulinism, should result in the diagnosis of GCK and GDH deficiency. And if it is a ketotic hypoglycemia, one needs to consider the possibility of endocrine causes. Glucose requirement are a direct clue in the sense that those who have a substrate problem will require 6 to milligram per kilogram per minute of glucose and that will be sufficient. While those who are requiring more than 12 milligram per kilogram per minute are most likely thinking having a hyperinsulinism as a cause. The onset of hypoglycemia at an early stage within the first few days is indicative of hyperinsulinism and hypopit. While if it started after feeding has been initiated, one should think of a possibility of galactosemia or organic acidemia. Detailed history of maternal exposure to beta blockers and thiazide, which are associated with neonatal hypoglycemia. RH incompatibility and birth asphyxia, which may cause hyperinsulinism. And insertion of UAC should be considered because they, this also can cause a possibility of hyperinsulinism. Examination should look for hepatomegaly and one need to really get off the mindset that hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia is equivalent to glycogen storage disease because GSD typically does not present in the newborn period. So hepatomegaly in a newborn with hypoglycemia should indicate hyperinsulinism, beckwith Wiedemann syndrome and galactosemia. Micropenis is a direct pointer to hypopyriterism or rarely an adrenal problem because of adrenal hypoplasia congenita. Pigmentation in this setting is indicative of 21 hydroxyl deficiency or again AHC. 21 hydroxyl deficiency typically does not cause hypoglycemia and the picture is predominant with hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis and salt wasting but six situations they can also have associated hypoglycemia. Neonatal cholestasis should raise the possibility of hypopyriterism and galactosemia while cataract is a characteristic feature of galactosemia. One should also carefully examine the child for eye signs like nystagmus which may be a direct pointers to septo-optic dysplasia which may be associated with the HESX1 mutation. Any disorder of sexual differentiation should point to the possibility of a congenital adrenal hypoplasia while omphalocel may be the only marker of beckwith Wiedemann syndrome and one may often miss the ear creases and the asymmetry which is there in this condition. The most important aspect of evaluation of a newborn with hypoglycemia is to obtain the critical samples which include ketones and reducing substances in the urine and blood levels of ketone, pH, electrolytes and lactate along with counter-regulatory hormones, insulin and C-peptide. C-peptide is secreted along with insulin by the beta cell in an equimolar amount and because of the longer half-life may give a better picture as far as the level of insulin is concerned. Acyl carnitine and organic acid levels should also be, be kept. Now, while we are talking about taking so many samples for critical sample, it does not mean that each and every sample should be processed immediately. 
the decision to process a particular sample will depend upon the outcome of results and it becomes important. The most important investigation out here are the ketone, electrolyte and lactate. In most cases, they will give the direction of diagnosis. So how do we really interpret these critical samples? One would expect that in the setting of hypoglycemia, the ketone level should be high and insulin level should be undetectable. Any detectable insulin in a child with hypoglycemia is suggestive of hyperinsulinism. Similarly, if the lactate levels are high, it is indicative of glycogen storage disease type 1 and gluconeogenic defect. Cortisone and growth hormone levels should be sky high in the presence of hypoglycemia. If they are inappropriately normal or low, we should consider the possibility of hyperterism. And as discussed, ketone plays a very important role and one would expect ketone levels to be high. Every child with hypoglycemia should produce ketone unless there is a problem of insulin excess which is blocking lipolysis and ketogenesis or a problem of fatty acid oxidation defect which again is impairing the production of ketones or finally in the setting of galactosemia and fructose intolerance. So low ketone levels in the setting of hypoglycemia in the newborn period should raise the possibility of hyperinsulinism, galactosemia and fructose intolerance. Hypoketotic hypoglycemia between 0.6 to 2 millimoles per liter should indicate the possibility of a fatty acid oxidation defect while levels which are more than 2 can be associated with number of other conditions like organic acidemias and endocrine etiology. Urine ketones are still used by many centers and they have a theoretical advantage that they remain positive for a longer period. So if somehow there has been a rapid correction which has been given for glucose level, one should always do a urine ketone which will be positive for a longer period of time. Having said that, the immediate precedence of management of symptomatic hypoglycemia is to take the samples and then give glucose. Glucagon response test is a way to confirm the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism and this is done using a glucagon in the dose of 30 micrograms per kilogram which should be given IM or subcutaneously and glucose and lactate levels are done at 0 and 30 minutes. In the setting of fasting, one would expect no further rise in glucose level, but in hyperinsulinism, the glucose level will increase by more than 30 mg per dl and this is very important in doubtful cases. So based upon these investigations, one can really classify a number of conditions associated with hypoglycemia including hyperinsulinism, fatty acid defects, galactosemias and GSD. So hypoketosis is directly characteristic of hyperinsulinism or a fatty acid oxidation defect and rarely characteristic While lactate levels if they are high they are indicative of GSD1 or a gluconeogenic defect. Metabolic acidosis is again a strong pointer in a newborn with metabolic acidosis and hypoglycemia towards organic acidemia. While any detectable insulin in the setting of hypoglycemia is suggestive of hyperinsulinism. Glucagon test in the fasting state will have a positive response in hyperinsulinism. So mainly out of the critical samples, ketone, lactate, blood gas play a very important role. So based upon these findings, one can now decide about the approach to neonatal hypoglycemia. The first step is to look at ketones. If the ketone levels are low, we are dealing with either galactosemia, fatty acid oxidation defect or hyperinsulinism. Look at urinary reducing substance. If there is non-glucose urinary reducing substance positive, it could be in the newborn period usually galactosemia. While if there is no urine reducing substance, insulin level should be done, which if detectable suggest hyperinsulinism, while if they are undetectable, they suggest fatty acid oxidation defect. In the presence of ketone, lactic acid levels should be considered which if high in the newborn will typically indicate towards the possibility of organic acidemia, while if normal, we should look for organomegaly, if present, it could be really GSD3 and 6, while if it is absent, one should look at the growth hormone and cortisol levels, 
which if low are suggestive of hypopyrethroism. So a combination of ketone reducing substance, insulin and lactate will give us the diagnosis in most cases. Further workup of neonatal hypoglycemia will depend upon whether the ketones are there or not. For non-ketotic hypoglycemia, we look at reducing substance insulin level and acyl carnitine profile for fatty acid oxidation defects. For ketotic hypoglycemia, one should look at pH and lactate, growth hormone and cortisol and organic acid profile. Confirmation of hyperinsulinism is often important because insulin levels may not be really high and it will be at a borderline situation which will cause confusion. So, high insulin can be demonstrated using a detectable insulin during hypoglycemia along with high C-peptide levels. Hypoketosis in this setting is really suggestive of hyperinsulinism along with low free fatty acid and a glucagon response in the fasting state of more than 30. Once the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism has been made, the major issue is whether it will respond to medical therapy or surgery is required. Most conditions of hyperinsulinism including transient, prolonged and GCK and GDH effects are basically treatable with dioxide, while only this diffuse form or focal form of potassium ATP channel defects require surgery. So the main issue is first to rule out reversible causes like infant or diabetic mother, RH incompatibility and once that's done, we should look at the ammonia level. If the ammonia levels are high, this is indicative of a GDH defect and there should be a trial for dioxide. If the ammonia levels are normal, even then a dioxide trial should be given if there is a response, the treatment should be continued. If there is no response, we are dealing mostly with a potassium ATP defect. In that setting, a DOPA PET should be considered. If it shows a focal lesion, it should be resected, while diffuse lesion requires pancreatectomy. So the approach for hyperinsulinism largely depends upon the presence of ammonia and response to dioxide. Lack of Elevated ammonia and response to dioxide should directly point towards a differentiation of focal and diffuse disease using a DOPA PET scan. So coming on to the cases of neonatal hypoglycemia, we have this 3 week old boy who presented with seizures and sugars of 28. So the first step is to look at ketones which were positive. So this was a ketotic hypoglycemia excluding the possibility of hyperinsulinism. The next step is to look at lactate levels and the lactate levels were normal along with hyponatremia. So we have a child who has ketotic hypoglycemia with lactic acidosis with low levels of sodium and this basically would be indicating towards an endocrine cause. But when we look at the child, the child clearly has a small phallic size, micropenis and then we did a growth hormone and cortisol levels which were inappropriately low for the levels of hypoglycemia. It's important to understand that the levels of these hormones should have been taken at the time of hypoglycemia. The processing of the samples will be decided based upon the results. So it's very important to take all the critical samples before correcting hypoglycemia and then process them according to the levels. So this case clearly indicates the importance of taking critical sample and looking at micropenis and that really pointed towards the possibility of hypopyrethroism in this setting. Six month old boy with lethargy and blood sugar of 36, ketone levels were done which were high. So next step is to see whether the lactate levels are high or not and then again there were definitely lactic acidosis and therefore a possibility of GSD1 or a gluconeogenic defect was considered. Here was significant hepatomegaly and glycogen storage disease. GSD typically doesn't present in the first two to three months of life, but rarely can present if the child is not feeding well in the initial phase of life. Three week old boy presenting with failure to thrive. The blood sugar levels were found to be 30 and the glucose infusion requirement was six, which is physiological. The child also had hepatomegaly. So we looked at ketone levels, which were low. So this is a hypoketotic hypoglycemia with normal glucose requirement, which in a way excludes hyperinsulinism. 
so this is either a fatty acid oxidation defect or a galactosemia situation and both of them will be associated with hepatomegaly so the next step in this setting is to look at the urine reducing substance which was positive for a non glucose reducing substance confirming the diagnosis of galactosemia so galactosemia should be considered in a child who presents around 2 to 3 weeks of life with failure to thrive irritability hepatomegaly cholestasis cataract and hypoglycemia this will be a hypoketotic hypoglycemia along with reducing substances which will be positive 10 day old girl presented with hypoglycemia requiring a high glucose infusion rate which goes against the diagnosis of a primary substrate defect the condition we looked at ketones which were low reducing substances were again negative so we are either dealing with a fatty acid oxidation defect or hyperinsulinism but since the glucose infusion requirement is very high it's most likely hyperinsulinism so insulin level was again found to be detectable and this is confirmatory for hyperinsulinism and there was a glucagon response which was present confirming the diagnosis so hyperinsulinism should be considered in the setting of high glucose infusion requirement non ketotic hypoglycemia and reducing substance being negative again a 6 day old girl with hypoglycemia birth weight was 3.4 kg so it is against macrosomia ketone levels were negative and reducing substance levels were also negative so again we are dealing with a situation of either hyperinsulinism or fatty acid oxidation defect now the results were really interesting the insulin levels were 3 and the growth hormone and cortisol levels were also low so whether it is a primary problem as far as hyperinsulinism or it is a situation wherein there is a endocrine deficiency with stress induced hyperinsulinism and this is a major issue but given the fact that there is hypoketosis and insulin level is detectable one should be more likely dealing with the possibility of hyperinsulinism and here in again a glucagon response was done which confirmed the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism 